Good that you're here with us today. Let's look at Exodus chapter 5. Exodus chapter 5, and we're going to be uh, continuing through the book of Exodus, and I'm excited about the message today. Uh, I hope that it will uh, will be a blessing. I'm, I've called it this, To Whom Will You Cry? And I uh, hate to uh, give away the punchline in the title. I try not to do that as much as I can, but I think I did this week, and that's okay. Uh, let's look at verse 15 together, Exodus 5, 15. If you found that place in your Bible, if you'll stand with me. Uh, we'll read throughout the rest of the chapter, and then I'll remind you of what's going on here in the chapter, and uh, we'll get right into it. The Bible says in Exodus 5.15, Then the officers of the children of Israel came and cried unto Pharaoh, saying, Wherefore dealest thou thus with thy servants? There is no straw given unto thy servants, and they say to us, Make brick. And behold, thy servants are beaten, but the fault is in thine own people. But he said, Ye are idle, ye are idle. Therefore ye say, Let us go and do sacrifice to the Lord. Go therefore now and work, for there shall no straw be given you, yet ye shall deliver the tale of bricks. And the officers of the children of Israel did see that they were in evil case, after it was said, Ye shall not minish aught from the bricks of your daily task. And they met Moses and Aaron, who stood in the way as they came forth from Pharaoh. And they said unto him, I'm sorry, and they said unto them, The Lord look upon you and judge, because ye have made our savor to be abhorred in the eyes of Pharaoh, in the eyes of his servants, to put a sword in their hand to slay us. And Moses returned unto the Lord and said, Lord, wherefore hast thou so evil treated this people? Why is it that thou hast sent me? For since I came to Pharaoh to speak in thy name, he hath done evil to this people, neither hast thou delivered thy people at all. Bold prayer from Moses, wouldn't you say? Uh, we'll talk about it. Father, we pray that you would help in, uh, in the message today. I ask, God, that you give me the words to say. Uh, Lord, the message that's here, I believe, is, is very helpful uh, if we'll understand it and, uh, and we'll take it to heart. So revealing about the children of Israel and their status uh, before you is their response. And so I pray that you give us wisdom and help us, Lord, to, to be more conformed to your image because of your word today. I pray again for your help. We're dependent upon you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You can be seated. I do appreciate you standing. There seems to be an underlying, or there doesn't seem to be, there is an underlying theme in the first few verse or chapters of Exodus. And actually, uh, it's kind of unfair because this theme is throughout the whole Bible and it's throughout our whole lives. But it is the theme of Romans 8.28 that says, And we know that all things work together for good uh, to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. Especially in this passage and the passages we've read so far in Exodus, there, this theme really starts to show itself, meaning that all the things that are going on don't necessarily look positive from the outside. And they certainly wouldn't have all looked positive from Moses' perspective or the children of Israel's perspective or anyone else's. And even as we read, we think, man, they were in a tough situation. But so far, all the things we've read in the book of Exodus are that way, that they're, they're difficult maybe in our eyes, but when we step back as as we can now, a few thousand years later, and read about what happened, we understand that all the while God was working things out for good. And in the Christian life, in your life, you need to remember that. You need to remember that God is, if you're a child of His, and I've got I've to make that clear because it's those that are called according to His purpose uh, that, that He's working things out to, for good. So if you're saved today, you're a child of God, you're following Him, I can promise you based on Romans 8, 28, He is working all things out for good. Now that doesn't always become apparent to us based upon our situation, does it? A lot of times we see the circumstances in our way and we think, how could this be part of God's plan? How could this be something that He's working out for good? But I just want you to recall the things we've already studied in Exodus. The birth of Moses. What a time to be born. When the Pharaoh says, any man child that's born, you'll cast in the river. That is the time when Moses was born. So as his mama, you'd think that is not a good time to have a child. But it was the perfect time 
in God's eyes, the perfect time. God wasn't worried about that edict at all. He wasn't worried in, in any sense of the word. He was not worried about the birth of Moses. And, and then we see how Moses was providentially cared for and preserved. And, and you know, he's put into that river. It, really, that river should have been the end of him. But yet that was the river that God used to get him into Pharaoh's household where he could be properly brought up and trained to one day overthrow Pharaoh. I mean, God's always working. Even when Moses makes a mistake and, and kills that Egyptian and he flees into Midian and he's in the wilderness for 40 years and he probably felt like a failure and thought, what am I doing in this wilderness? God's called me to something different, yet I'm in this wilderness. He didn't know that he would be leading the children of Israel in that wilderness for 40 years here in just a little while. He was getting trained that whole time and, and learning how to herd sheep and learning how to, to find his way in that desert. He eventually uh, found the Lord in that burning bush, as we know. And so God is, uh, again, Moses has a pretty rough story if you look at it and the things he's gone through. And the children of Israel have some pretty difficult circumstances. But we know, based upon our reading, that God is working things out for good. I'm really, I'm really bad about this in my own life, it, it, is that it's really tough to see past our own blinders. It's really tough to see past our own circumstances to, to sort of get outside of ourselves and see what God is doing. Um, but he's always looking at not only just our situation, which he is, but he's also looking at the big picture. And so this theme of him working things out for good um, has been going on in the book of Exodus, and that is going to continue here. Now, again, remember what's happened here. Moses finally obeys God. He's 80 years old. It's taken him quite a while. He's gone through all the excuses he can think of. Now he has no excuses left. And so he's finally obedient to God. He goes to Pharaoh and he does exactly what God tells him to do, which is to get before Pharaoh and tell the Pharaoh, let my people go that we may go and sacrifice in the wilderness. So he's finally obedient. And what does Pharaoh do? You remember last week? Pharaoh said, I'm not letting these people go. He said, who is God? Who's God that I should obey him? And so this whole thing, if you think about Moses' perspective, the whole thing just blows up in his face. I, I was, um, I've done this before where I've, I've, I've prayed for someone's soul and, and like a friend of mine, and, and I've thought, uh, you know, I, I just need the courage to witness to him. I need the words to say. I need all the, you know, and, and you kind of gear yourself up, and then you finally go there. Today's the day. Today's the day I'm going to witness to them. And, and I've had that happen where then we had a conversation and whenever they walked away, I felt like they were more resistant to the gospel than they were before. And I think, what in the world? But listen, we don't worry about the results, do we? We're just supposed to be obedient. And so here's Moses. He's just being obedient. The results are up to God. Now, God knows that Pharaoh will indeed let them go, but God knows it's going to be a process. There's going to be some things happen that, that cause the Pharaoh to let him go. So it, it's just interesting that Moses finally becomes obedient, does everything that, that he's supposed to do, and all of a sudden it just blows up in his face. And Pharaoh says, I'm not letting them go. In fact, you got too much time on your hands. That's essentially what he says. If you're coming to me asking to be free, you got too much time on your hands, so we're going to stop giving you the materials that you need to build the bricks that we're making you to build, and I still want the same amount of bricks at the end of the day. So he puts all this extra work on Israel, and so this thing really backfires on Moses, or seemingly backfires on Moses. I want to say this, though. I have read the rest of the book of Exodus, and I know that God was still working things out for good. Whether they knew it or not, he was working things out for good. I, 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 this is where we're going to get to today. God was beginning the process of freeing Israel from Egypt. But it had to be more than just changing their address. God wanted to do more than just take Egypt from one piece of property and move them to another. Israel's heart had to be freed from Egypt as well. Um, I'm going to work on this thought for just a minute. The hooks of the world 
we're still holding them. I want you to think about something for a second. The Bible tells us that Israel was in bondage to Egypt for 400 years. That means every living Israelite was born into slavery in Egypt. Every one of them that was there was born into slavery. They knew nothing else. They did not know freedom. They did not know about uh, their land that they had been promised. They didn't even know much, although there were, um, there were some elders there and, and there were some that were holding on to the faith, but most of them were born into a pagan and godless culture and knew nothing different. Have you ever thought about that? 400 years? What would happen to this group of people if we left our Bibles in this room and we went on to an island somewhere without our Bibles and we lived for 400 years? Would you expect 400 years from now the people there to know the God that you know? I hope that they would, but it's very likely without God's Word and, and without reten retention of that and keeping up to that, especially with the burden placed upon them, the pagan society that they were living in. Listen, they were in Egypt, and, and let me say this, they were used to it. They were used to it. They were, in a way, they were okay with it. There had to be a heart change. It's not that they could just be pulled out and placed into another land. I believe if, if God had just pulled them out of that land and placed them in their own land, do you think that they would have all of a sudden just been great worshipers of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? No, I believe they would have probably taken all the stuff they had learned in Egypt, they had probably just take that stuff right there with them and do whatever they want. Again, this is a picture of salvation. It's a picture of someone exiting the world. That's where we get that word exodus, or rather we get our word exit from that same word of exodus. So it's them exiting from the world and into uh, the, the, the promised land, which would for us would be in Christ. So there's more than just a change of um, an address. A lot of people live their life and, and they're not going the way that God wants them to go. And so, but they don't like the results that they're getting. The way of the transgressor is hard. I, I say that all the time because it is true. Uh, and so that people live how they want, but then they don't like the results that they're getting. So they decide, we would say it like this, we're, they're going to turn over a new leaf. You ever heard that? Turn over a new leaf. What does that mean? Well, I'm going to just kind of force myself to stop doing some things. I'm going to do some things better. I'm, maybe I'm going to change my friends. I'm going to change where I live. I'm going to change, you know, whatever. We're going to make a big change. You know what I found? Um, if I take myself and my sin into a new environment, nothing actually really changes. I read a story about some monks that were just really sick of the, the sin and the, the, the perverseness of the world and the, you know, the greed in society and the, the, the anger and the unforgiveness, all the stuff. They were really sick of that. So they decided that we're going to go up here as a group. We're going to live on top of this mountain and we're going to be secluded and, and it's just going to be like this great, wonderful place up there. Do you know what they found? They found that there was jealousy and envy and strife and problems up there in the mountain with just them. They had to conclude, well, we brought it with us. Um, you know, maybe, maybe this will work out better. I could go out here. I could not do this, but just imagine I could. I could go out here in the woods and get a grizzly bear. And bring him into church today and say, this grizzly bear is turning over a new leaf. You realize you better change something about that bear before you bring him in here. Does that make sense? So many times we want to make some, some physical change in our life. And not all change is bad. If we're hanging out with bad friends, yes, we should get away from that group and, and, and get some better friends. There's no doubt about that. But, but too much of our struggle is we just think if I could just go to a new place or do a new thing or, or turn over a new leaf, be in a better environment, uh, whatever the case is, then all of a sudden my problems would go away. And what I've found out in my life is wherever I go, so do my problems. Because there's something inside of me. I'm just dragging them around. Israel needed a heart change. Do you know what we need today? We need a heart change. If you're unsaved today, you need a heart change. You don't need a new leaf. You don't need a, a new perspective or, or you need a complete heart change. The Bible calls it an operation. Colossians 2 verse 11, in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands 
in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, where, where, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead, and you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. That is a lot of, of words, and there's some actual medical terms in there to tell us about the heart transplant that takes place when you place your faith in Christ. Old things are passed away. The old man dies. The, you are alive in Christ. You're placed into Christ. You're, you're a new creature. It's an operation. It's a change. If you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior today, you can turn over all the new leaves you want. And you can move, and, and, and I'm not just talking about move, but you can change your circumstances a thousand times. It will never uh, get rid of your problems. Jesus is the answer to your problems need to be saved now once we're saved god will begin this work that we don't always enjoy to cut our attachments to the world he'll start to chip away at things that we used to like that we can't do anymore that we used to hang out but we can't go anymore he'll begin to sever some of our attachments to the world and it'll feel uncomfortable but let me assure you, God is working out all things for the good. The process of discipleship is not for the faint at heart. Discipleship teaches us, and what I mean by discipleship is the Lord is drawing us closer to Him. It teaches us to love and trust and serve Him. It also teaches us to be separate from the world. I'm saying all this because... Israel was excited about the possibility of salvation. Let me just say it like this. They were tired of making bricks. They were tired of the Pharaoh telling them to make bricks. And they were tired of the plight of their life. And they weren't enjoying the results they were getting. And so they were excited to leave Egypt and go into the promised land. They were excited about that, but they had no idea the change that God was going to make in their hearts. I'm not even sure they were ready for that yet. So um, many times God will allow difficulty in our lives to mitigate change. If you've ever been through a trial, I mean like a real trial of life. I don't mean like your Starbucks was a little underheated and they put too much cream or whatever. I, a real trial of life. You ever been through a real trial of life? You come out different, don't you? You come out different and hopefully you come out for the better because you've allowed God to walk with you through that trial. And so what God is doing here in Exodus 5 with without a doubt, because I'm going to show you uh, there's there's evidence in the text here that Israel needed some heart changing. And so what God is doing is he's allowing some difficulty. So they're all like, Moses, God hasn't delivered us. You've come and you, you're, you're saying you can do all these things. You can't do those things. And they're upset and they're mad. Why aren't we in uh, the promised land yet? Why are we still in Egypt? The whole time God is, is doing something in their hearts. He is going to redeem them from that land. But he's trying to deal with their heart. He used trials to do so. I have to remind myself when I go through a trial Apparently, I am in need of whatever the trial is going to give me. Now, I don't like to admit that because I'd rather just get out of the trial. But apparently, I need something from the Lord that I'm not getting elsewhere that he is going to teach me in the trial. Israel's need is extremely evident in these few verses. <clears throat> It's evident in the reaction that they had to the trial itself. The, their reaction revealed some things about their selves that gave the reason to why they needed the trial in the first place. <clears throat> there are three ways that they demonstrated this. The first is this. They cried to the wrong God. Look at verse 15. Then the officers of the children of Israel came and cried unto Pharaoh. Very simply, let me ask this question. When times get hard in your life, 
Who do you cry to? They went not to Jehovah God. You notice this? They didn't all fall on their knees in prayer and beg the God of heaven. Why? Well, for 400 years, they haven't known him. Where'd they go? The one they were dependent upon, Pharaoh. Now, Pharaoh in the passage is a picture of Satan. Egypt is a picture of the world. So it's as if they went to the world. There, that was where their dependence was. That was where they cried to. That was where they thought they might get help. But Pharaoh was not interested in helping them, was he? You know what Pharaoh was interested in? Bricks and lots of them. You know what Satan is interested in? He's not interested in helping you. He's interested in you serving him. Bricks, sin, the entanglements of the world. That's what he's interested in. The fact that they went and cried to the one who was uh, persecuting them speaks volumes about their heart. There was a string there that needed to be cut. Why didn't they go to Jehovah God? Because they didn't know him. Well, at least they weren't depending upon him. I found this out in my life. Sometimes God lets me uh, fumble through every scenario I can until I realize, okay, I guess God's the only one I can depend on. You know why he does that? So that we'll know he's the only one we're to depend on. So God allows a little hardship here. No, I'm not going to let you go. In fact, I'm not going to give you straw anymore. And at the end of the day, there better be bricks standing there. So many times when we go through troubles and trials, we cry to someone other than God. We cry to anyone who will listen. Anyone who we think may help. And many times, it's, it's sad, but many times, God is the last one we come to with our problem. But Jesus said, come unto me. All ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. We're told to take our problems not to the world, not to uh, all the solutions that they might have, but to God. God may even bring us, when we're in this state, God may bring us through trials just to let us know, you've got to come to me with your problems. Um. I could give a bunch of examples. I want to, but our, our world, our country, it's a mess. Amen? I mean, if you agree with anything I say today, you could probably agree with that. It's a mess. It's a disaster, actually. It's a complete disaster. I mean... We can't even describe, we can spend the rest of the day trying to, we can't even describe how messed up not only our society is, but, you know, now there's this really, um, just really upside down morality going on. I mean, just, we've just lost it as a nation and people. Haven't we? Or we could say they, Okay. I don't think we've all lost it, but we're, who are you going to cry to? Um, I'm not saying there's not a time. I'm not saying there's like, there, there should be a time when you call your congressman. There should be a time perhaps when you complain to the governor or even to the president or whatever. But I mean, I've been alive 40 years so far. They haven't answered any of our troubles. Why do we keep crying to them? Why do we expect that the president can do anything more than God? I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be real here. We'll complain. I mean, I, I feel like I've been on Facebook in the preaching lately, and I have Facebook, so I can preach against it, okay? But why can I be a Facebook warrior you know, and try to convince all those people out there that I understand how this world is, and this is what we need to do. And, I'm, and I, I, I put my cry on Facebook. Boy, that's helped a lot of people, hadn't it? Why are the Christians not going to God? Just think, you don't have to say it out loud. 
How many minutes did you spend this week praying for our country? Praying for our leadership. How many minutes? But how many minutes did you spend this week reading articles about the mess and the chaos and getting all upheavaled inside and maybe even making comments and that kind of thing? And by the way, I haven't been reading anybody's comments, okay? That's not... I do read the comments. That's pretty much why I have Facebook. But I, I, I don't... Uh, I haven't this week. I'm not... I'm not trying to get on anybody or anything that was said. I'm just saying, when we, when we look at what Israel did, they cried to Pharaoh, not God. We do the very same thing. We cry to each other. We, we put our, our case out there before the masses to be read. And, you know, if we get a few likes, it makes us feel good about things. But we've changed nothing. God can change. God can affect things. Okay, we got to keep moving here. Um, we are to pray for our leaders, by the way. In, in, in 1 Timothy, Paul tells us, I, I, exalt, I exhort, therefore, for that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceful life in all godliness and honesty. You know what that verse tells me? If I have problems with how this nation, country, city, state is going, I need to go to God and pray about it. Um, so far, I don't think Joe Biden's done one thing I agree with. I, I just, I don't think so. I mean, I get, maybe I could, I like ice cream, so we might could agree there. But I'm, I'm convicted in how little I've prayed for that man. Right? How much have you prayed for him? He's the leader of the free world. We're not praying for him? What's interesting is that these officers actually had access to Pharaoh. I don't have access to the president. They had access to Pharaoh. What they didn't realize, though, is they had access to God Almighty. Did you know this? You have access to the God of the universe. This is an amazing truth. You and I, the, as the songwriter would call us, the worm that we are, can speak to the God who created the heavens and the earth. It says in Ephesians 2, for through Him... We both have access by one Spirit unto the Father, and therefore ye are no more strangers or foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. Not only do we have access to God, it tells us amazingly that God wants us to come to Him with our problems. Have you ever thought you were bothering God with your prayer? I have. You're not. He's not limited. He doesn't get tired. He, he's not bothered. It's not like he's up there and, and oh, oh, too many prayers today. Woo. Right? He's not like us, folks. He's God. He wants us to come to him and pray to him. He asks us to do so. He tells us we can come into the throne boldly in time of need. Hebrews 4. The people went to Pharaoh I've heard a lot of people bash Moses for his prayer. And I want to, because he, I mean, I feel like a lightning bolt would have hit me if I prayed that. But you know what? The people went to Pharaoh. Where did Moses go? He went to God. Mo Moses didn't go back to Pharaoh and cry to him. He went to God. Look at verse 22. Moses returned unto the Lord and said, Lord, Wherefore hast thou so entreat, evil entreated this people? Why is it that thou hast sent me? For since I came to Pharaoh to speak in thy name, he hath done evil to this people. Neither hast thou delivered thy people at all. Now again, if you're, the, if you're in the prayer meeting with Moses, you're probably backing out as he's saying some of those words. But I, I want to clue you in on something. Whatever you say with your mouth in your prayer, do you know God already knows what's in your heart? You know that? We get, really, we get really weird about our prayers. When, it, when we start to pray, we start using words we would never use otherwise in conversation. Do we not? 
I, I don't use the word consecrate much. Only when I'm preaching, and I usually give a lot simpler explanation so that I don't have to say it again. Why is it when I get to my prayer life, all of a sudden I'm spiritual? All of a sudden I know all the Bible lingo and going to say everything just right. I just feel like God's like, hey, liar, why don't you just talk to me? Stop acting like, I know, I know you don't use those words. You don't even know what that means, you know. Don't act like you're not upset about this. Just talk to me. Now, listen, we approach God with reverence. He's a holy God. He's sovereign. He's completely righteous in every way. We don't come to him. Uh, you know, there, there's a way you approach God, and it's humbly. But you might as well be honest. Because he knows. He just knows. I've gone to God and said, Lord, I'm upset about this. I'm mad about this. I don't understand what you're doing. You know what? I believe God respects that more than me crying to the Pharaoh. So, who would he cry? A lot of times we don't even know what to say. We're hurt, angry, frustrated, confused, discouraged, whatever, despondent. Go talk to God. Reverently and humbly approach the throne in times of need. You will get help. I don't know how many times in my life something has happened and I have cried, I've, I've cried about it to everyone I know how to, to cry to. I've tried, you know, whether it's a financial trouble, the Lord's brought our family through some of those. And in, fi in times of financial trouble, I'm, I'm kind of business minded and I'm, I'm, I, I try to be self-sufficient. So there's just something in me that says, fix it. And so I just start trying to fix it. And I've, I've, I've experienced the Lord letting me get to the end of every option I had and get to the point where saying, well, God, I can't do it. I guess you're going to have to. And guess what happens? That's the time when he fixes it. What if I would have done that right at the beginning? We could talk about all kinds of stuff. Family trouble, relationship trouble, physical, physical trouble. Seek God. He has the power for these things. So they cried to the wrong God. Secondly, they were, try, they were trying to please the wrong God. So first of all, they're, they're dependent upon the wrong God. They're coming to Pharaoh instead of God. Secondly, they're trying to please the wrong God. They, let me say it like this. They care more about what Pharaoh thinks than what God thinks. How do I know that? Look at verse 20. It says this, And they met Moses and Aaron who stood in the way as they came forth from Pharaoh, and they said unto him, the Lord look upon you and judge because ye have made our savor to be abhorred in the eyes of Pharaoh and in the eyes of his servants. He uses this word savor. I may have used this illustration here. I was trying to think if I had or not, and I've, I know I've used it somewhere within the last year. So I may have said this. If I said it, just laugh and pretend like I hadn't, okay? Um, but, but one time I was, I was working I was, when I was still doing construction quite a bit, and, um, and uh, I might have been working on something at the church, but I was working all day and is out in the, the heat. And so, you know, you can imagine I was pretty dirty and I get in really late in the evening and it's time for the kids to go to bed. And so I get home after just a just a supremely long day and I'm tired and every joint hurts and I'm covered in dirt. And, you know, and there's my beautiful children. It's bedtime. Bedtime is one of my favorite times of the day. It's just a time when, well, I don't know, lately they've been real ornery at bedtime, but usually it's like a little sweet time where you can pray with them and talk to them a little bit. And, and um, anyway, that was one of those times. And, and I just remember I went over to Brindley and I was giving her a little sweet hug and, and all that. And lo I love you, Brindley. I hope you have a good night. She goes, you stink. <laughs> just like that. Honesty of a child. That's all she said. It's like, you sleep well, child. I'm, I'm out of here. Um, that word savor that we just read, you've caused us 
You've made our savor, our smell, to be abhorred in the eyes of Pharaoh. You know, that word savor is interesting. It has to do with how we smell, but not uh, physically like Brindley was talking about, but rather how our lives smell to God. It's very much connected with the, the idea of worship in the Scripture. In Exodus 29, when they finally do get out and they are going to offer a ram on the altar, the Bible says it is a sweet savor, an offering made by fire unto the Lord. They said essentially this, you have made us to stink to the Pharaoh. That's what they said. They were worried about that. But apparently they weren't as concerned with how they smelled to God. Let me ask you this. Um, what are you more concerned about? Are you more concerned with how your life, and I know it's kind of weird to think about how your life smells, but you understand what I'm saying? Are you more worried about how the world thinks your life smells? Or how God thinks it smells? As people pleasers, we're always looking to make sure everyone around us is happy with us. We're trying to make sure that everyone around us, uh, you know, gets a, catches a sweet odor of our life. Many times at the expense of the odor that we're bringing up to the throne room of God. We're not supposed to be in friendship with the world. We're not supposed to be. In fact, Jesus said, marvel not if the world hate you. He, he says in another place that if you have friend, a friend of the world is enmity with God. And yet Christian people in 2023 are doing everything they can to fit into this world. We just don't want to cause too much of a stink, right? Listen, if you smell good to the world, you stink to God. That's what they're concerned. They're not like... They're not worried about sacrificing to God. They're saying, hey, you, Moses, you messed this up. Now Pharaoh doesn't even like us. Well, of course he doesn't. He's evil. Why are you concerned that Pharaoh doesn't like you? I'm, I'm telling you, I'm a, I like people to like me. I said this. I have, what, I have nothing to hide. I like to, you know, as a pastor, you want everyone happy with you? You know what I've learned as a pastor? You got to choose God before men. You got to do it pretty often. It's extremely uncomfortable, but you just got to do it. I'm going to preach in the message here in just a little bit about the day we get to meet the Lord. Do you know what? None of you are going to stand in front of me as my judge. Now, I'm not saying that. That sounded really rude. I'm not going to stand in front of you at your judgment either. Do you know that? It'll be God. So care how you smell to him. Not to me, and not to each other. What I'm saying, I'm putting myself right there with you. We're not... Man, we, we work so hard to make sure that this world likes us. This world isn't supposed to like us. Thirdly, they feared the wrong God. In verse 21, as we finish out that verse, it says, and they've... You know, Moses, you not only made us distinct to Pharaoh and the, his servants... But it says to put a sword in their hand to slay us. No man on earth, not even Pharaoh, has power over God. It would be absurd to think so. I'm going to uh, spare a little bit of time because I believe that you know today we serve an omnipotent God. Revelation 19 verse 6 tells us the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. So that means, that word omnipotent means that he has the power to do absolutely anything that he desires. He can do it. He has all power. He has no actual real adversaries. No one can hold a candle to God. No one can, can um, compete with God in any arena. He is omnipotent. And yet we fear men more than we fear him. They said, Pharaoh might just kill us now. Again, what are you more worried about? 
the all-powerful God and his desire or what Pharaoh may be able to do? So whom will they fear? So three things. They cried to the wrong God. That showed their dependence upon the world and Pharaoh. They uh, cared more about what the, the world and Pharaoh thought of them than they did of God. And thirdly, they feared the wrong God. And all of those things was their response. And that response revealed the condition of their heart was too attached to the world. Do you see now why God didn't just let them go that day? You know what's going to happen in the next few chapters? God is going to introduce himself to Pharaoh, to the Egyptians, and to the nation of Israel through ten plagues. And by the time it's all said and done, not only will they be free, but they will know who God is. They will know and they'll look back. In the rest of our Bible, they always look back and say, He is the God that brought us out of Egypt. You remember? It wasn't Moses just making a command. No, it was God in his might. Look to chapter 6, and I'm going to close with this. I just want you to know all things are working for good. Chapter 6, verse 1. Then, okay, so Moses prays this prayer. Verse 23, neither hast thou delivered thy people at all. Then, and only then, the Lord said unto Moses, Now, you see these words? Now shalt thou see what I will do to Pharaoh. For with a strong hand shall he let them go. With a strong hand shall he drive them out of his land. So God, Moses got to the end of every rope he had. He got to the end of every excuse he could play. He, he went and he did what, or what God wanted to, him to do. It did not seem to work. And so he goes and he cries to God. And he's like, God, we're out of options. We're relying on you. I mean, you're, you're our only hope. You ever said, um, well, all we can do is pray? That's a dumb statement. What do you mean all we can do is pray? It's the best thing we can do. You know why we say that? It's because we've already exercised all of our other options. Well, we couldn't fix it, so I guess we'll try to let God see if he can do it. You see how silly we are? All we can do is pray. God is saying in chapter 6, verse 1, okay, you're in the perfect spot. I can finally start working. You finally have realized you're not going to get out of this on your own, and you need me. I can do, I can deliver. When you, ladies and gentlemen, are at the end of your rope, you're at the end of yourself. You cannot do any more. It's as if God is saying like, okay, now you're going to see what I can do. Who do you cry to? Who do you cry to? Let's pray. Dear Lord, I want to thank you for all that you do. And Lord, as I preach this message, I understand my struggle with it. And uh, Lord, even this week thinking through it, you convicted me in many areas just because I'm a I'm a fixer I just I tend to get in my own way trying to fix problems that you want to fix father I uh, I pray you'd help us to see the misstep in our heart when we do this I pray that you'd help us to see sometimes our attachment to the world our reliance on the world our care that's connected to the world and Lord, the things that you're doing in our lives many times are just to break those connections so that we'll fully trust in you. I pray that your word would have done work today and will continue to do so. And I pray that you bless in this time of invitation. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen.